Well, good evening. God's peace. Well, good evening. God's peace to you, his dear saints, as we're gathered before the throne of our God tonight. Uh, just a couple of a quick announcements before we get started with what our Lord has for us tonight. Um, you'll see in the back, we have about a week and a half left of being able to sign up, but we're going to go to a Woodchucks game um, in Wausau at the end of the month of July. So July 31st is the game. It's at 1 o'clock. Tickets are $13. You can sign up on the back. Uh, what we'll probably do is we'll kind of go there and arrive, drive there separately, but we'll meet as a group. We'll have all the tickets together and everything. We did it last year and it worked out really well. So we had a good cohort of us signed up to go. So if you're interested, feel free to sign up on the back and it's a, it's a good time to hang out. We'll get some good weather to enjoy as well at the end of July there. So that, there's that for you. You have until July 3rd to sign up. Uh, so you still have about a week and a half left for that. Um, you'll notice here on June 30th, so next Thursday, we'll have our Sundays on Thursday. So you're welcome to come to service and stay for the ice cream following that. Uh, so a couple things uh, coming up as well. You'll see July as we come into it. We're, <laughs> it's already VBS time. Uh, so we'll need some volunteers and help. We're already having some people coming in, bringing in VBS supplies. Uh, so if you, if you see anything on the list that's been sent out in emails or the newsletter and things like that, feel free to grab those items. Or if you want, if you're having questions on what, to, what you can get, let us know. We'll be glad to fill you in. And so all of that. So you can read more, of course, on your pink insert, which we'll use tonight as well, as we are in our hymnals again tonight. Uh, we'll be following along on Divine Service Setting 1, which can be found on page 151 of your hymnals. Um, and we'll follow along with there. And the pink insert as well. If you have one of the large bulletins there, that's all there for you too. So as we come before our God this night, we give thanks to him who has come to set us free in Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we'll hear from Galatians chapter 5 tonight, and that's what we'll, we'll ponder on God's word this evening. So, we're assembled before our God. He's here tonight with his mercy and gifts of love in Jesus Christ. So let us now stand before him, forgiving him all of our sins and hearing that he has set us free in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue, which you can see it on your pink insert with the psalm this evening. It's Psalm 16, and we read it responsibly. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot.
I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. On page 154 of the hymnal, we now continue by singing the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated as we hear from God's Word tonight. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. Now behold, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel, they have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars. They have killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And now they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. 
And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out, and he stood at the entrance of the cave. Behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars. They have killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And now they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return back on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abba Mohalah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all of the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So Elijah departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth pair. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen. And Elisha ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, and he gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say the graduals can be found on the pink inserts tonight. We say it responsibly. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The word For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Our epistle lesson this night comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 5 and also our sermon text tonight. Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not be entangled to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not allow your freedom to be used as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you divide and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you. As I have warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. In honor of Christ, our Lord, and his gospel and his word that he speaks to us, let us now stand. And as we hear and begin by saying the Alleluia. Alleluia. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, please be seated. We sing tonight our, in our hymnals, Hymn 770, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Him 770. Find a friend so faithful. 
My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, one who has set us free, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We hear again this verse from Paul as he writes to the Galatians very adamantly. He says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand therefore and do not again be entangled in a yoke of slavery. This past week, you know, it's kind of becoming more popular as the years go on with the Juneteenth, June 19th, the day that we celebrate, rightfully, the slaves being set free. There's always a story that goes around. I see it circulate almost every year. I've seen several pastors comment on it, too. And one of the stories is on, on this date when the proclamation was being read at various plantations and places where people were in servitude and in bondage, they came and made the proclamation known. Several Union soldiers, their captain, their general would come and read the proclamation that everyone at the plantation, everyone at that place was free. They were no longer allowed to be slaves. Well, a curious thing would happen is that for a multitude of reasons, for lack of you know, ability to have actually a life for them, many of them just went right back to work on the plantation. They were free. But they went right back to doing what they were doing. You know, this plays out theologically a lot, too. I once heard a, a story. There was a, a, a Roman Catholic. There was some friends together, and one of them was going, and he was telling how he was going to go on a night of the town. It was a night of debauchery, a night of doing whatever they wanted to do. And one of them said, well, wait a minute. Aren't you a Christian? And that person said, well, yeah, yeah, but... I'm a Catholic, so I'll just go to the confession and confess it all later. Well, another person was there, and they happened to be Lutheran, and they say, well, we don't even bother with that. You, so, you see, we're saved by grace through faith alone, so we don't need any of that, right? We can do what we want, and we got all the forgiveness already wrapped up. You see, that's what Paul's talking about here, though, tonight in that verse. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not be enslaved, again, to a yoke bondage. Do not go back to the sin. You see, this is the reason why Jesus Christ came, right? The essential characteristic of the gospel is that Christ has set us free. But he has not set us free to go right back into the pigsty because we've just been cleaned up. Who would want to go back and muck into their sin when Christ has set us free from them, when he has cleaned us up and made us new? Well, of course, in our sinful flesh, you and I well know that that mud pile is where we always jump back into. Paul here tonight is arguing with these Galatians who want to put themselves back under the law, under the law of the Ten Commandments, under the law of the, the Torah, the Jewish instructions for living life, right? By doing so, they think that they'll be serving God. But Paul makes it very clear that by doing that, they are putting themselves back under slavery. That Christ has come, he's read the proclamation that you are free. That he has opened the cage, your shackles are gone. It's no longer the life that you have to live. And now for these Galatians, Paul has noted that they've gone right back to being slaves to their sin. You see, this is the essential characteristic that we must talk about more when it comes to the gospel that Jesus Christ has come to do. You see, he has come to open up a way of life that before his arrival was impossible. You know, yeah, the law was here to babysit us, as Paul would make note of. It's here to keep a check on us so that we're not running rampant. But the law can't give us the ability to live the life as God's faithful people. It is only something that Paul here gets into. It's only something that the Spirit can grant to you and to me. This is why he's making such a big deal. This is why he goes on in verse 13 and says, you were called to freedom, brothers. Right? It's not something that we can choose for ourselves. Our freedom has been bought for a price. It's the price of God's Son. The price that he paid for you because he loves you. And he wants you. But Paul says that this gospel being called to him, now that we're free, the law has no condemnation to speak over us. But Paul says, 
Do not use your freedom as an opportunity. But there's a better word that we can use there. As a beachhead for the flesh. You see, the flesh is always wanting to drag us back into our sin. And and Paul says that the gospel has not come so that we may have a license to sin. The gospel has come that we may freely live as God's people, freely in faith, freely in God's spirit that he has given to each and every single one of you in in the baptism that you have received. You see, how can we who have heard the proclamation that the Lord Jesus Christ has set us free, how can we dare go back to doing whatever it was that we were doing before he called us, before the freedom was given. For Paul, this is unthinkable, right? And for that, Paul notices that we have now entered into a war. You see, ongoing in each and every single one of us is the temptation and the fight of the flesh. This is why Paul starts getting into the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and they are opposed to one another. So we do not allow the flesh to get a beachhead in our life of faith with Christ. And when we notice that it is, call it out. We confess it. We return to the Lord who makes new, who has those advances of the flesh retreat so we may find faith and confidence in Christ. And so Paul says, instead of being slaves to our own flesh, let us be slaves out of love to one another. You see, the opposite of love for the neighbor is always self-gratification, self-pursuit, self-assertion, which is what gets into the works of the flesh here in a moment. But Paul would have us recognize that the central characteristic of the law, he writes all the summary of the law, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? The laws don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. Any other law that you could write out there really just comes down to love your neighbor. You see, that's how we as Christians define love, right? Love is not an ethereal feeling that I I, I feel connected with today, but I don't really feel it today, so good luck, right? Love is a commitment out of what God has given to you and to me and what we must guard for one another. You see, love is tied to the law, so the law isn't devoid of love. The Ten Commandments are the summary and the definition of what love is and when we do not, when we see that our lives are not in place with this, we see that we are out of step with love. As Paul goes forward, he notices that a mark of living in the flesh is that we will bite and devour one another. And he says, be careful, watch out that we are not consumed by one another. You see, the image here is of wild animals who are circling their prey and they're fighting over the scraps, right, as they're growling over one another. And Paul says, that's what we become if we allow the flesh to have its way with us. And it leads into all of the fruits of the works of the flesh, which we'll cover here in a moment. And so Paul, noticing this warfare that's in us, noticing what Christ has come to give, it's what we now face in our lives as Christians, he has to say this, he compels us. I say, he writes, walk by the Spirit. Now, if you're ever used to Paul's images, he's always frequently going for military metaphors, and this is one of them. Walk by the Spirit doesn't mean just walk on the path. It means keep in step. It means march, right? The Spirit's in marching step, and we follow in formation. We go along with Him, because that's what the Christian life is like. It's a walk. It's a march. It's a path that we go along, right? And the goal of the path is at times we're going to slip and fall down, but we get back up, we get back behind the Spirit, and we continue marching, following his lead, following his guidance that he has given to us because he is in us that we see. And we wrestle against the desires. We wrestle against our passions. We wrestle against that which we would seek for ourselves. And instead, we receive what the Spirit of God has given to us in our baptism, what he's coming in here tonight to reinforce and make strong in you again with this sacrament and through this very word that you would continue to hear the footsteps of the Spirit and follow along in marching formation with him. He, right, then Paul goes in, verse 18, I love it. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, right? How can you notice what the flesh is trying to do? Here's what it conjures up. Here's what happens in people's lives. Sexual immorality, the word for that is pornai. That's the word we get for porn. Impurity, which literally means uncleanliness, and it has to do with being unclean with the body. 
He goes further and says sensuality, which that's the word we get for a license, licentiousness, right? It means I have a license to do what I want. That's not the gospel. That's falling right back into slavery. Doing, we are tyrants to ourselves, and Jesus has come to set us free from ourselves. And then he goes forward. Idolatry, that's a work of the flesh, right? Worshiping what works. You see, Paul, in, in his day, what he deals with with people is that they would worship whatever works, right? You go and you find the God that seems to be working, and you do whatever it needs to do what that God wants, right? That's, and for Paul, even sometimes he'll get into the Jewish religion, that they will even sometimes turn the one true God into an idol, an idol that they just follow, because if I do this, well, then I get what I want. We even turn the one true God into idolatry, and that is a work of the flesh, then Paul continues on with sorcery. So where did where we get for uh, magic a little bit as well? In the ancient world, magic was very prevalent. Right? For people who are poor and lowly, if you, how do you fight against someone who's more powerful and wealthy than you? Well, you curse them. Right? You put a spell on them. Right? You, do, you do incantations. You leave it in various places. So that way, they might be scared and they would be controlled. Right? It's very popular in the ancient world, and it's making a comeback in our days today. I see it a lot, too. He pushes forward enmity. Right? This is hostilities. Right? Hostilities are a work of the flesh. Strife is where we get the word temper. Right? People who are quick to temper. It's a work of the flesh. Jealousy. Right, when we're envious of what others have, what maybe what other Christians have, right? what our next-door neighbor has, what the other church is doing, we get envious of it. Fits of anger. Right? There's that word anger again. Rivalries. Right? I, was, I was reading a, a pamphlet this past week. It was interesting. We were going through some of the, uh, all these old documents in our congregation, and we pulled out some old uh, uh, journals and uh, things that you get from other periodicals. And one of the periodicals says that a, a track of a growing church is to keep up with the churches around you. Little did they know that that's a work of the flesh. Right? To keep up with the Joneses. Dissensions. Right? So we're actually, dissensions is where we get the word heresy from, right? Having options, divisions, envy, and then he continues on, right? Drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, right? Paul is like, we don't even have to go any further. We know we could just have example, have example in our own society. We have it too, don't we? You look online, it's not too long until you find examples of the works of the flesh. And then Paul has to give the warning, right? Just as he speaks, he warned them once, and now he's going to warn them again. We get to hear the warning too, I warn you, as I warned you before, he writes, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, it's popular in our day to let those who are outside, who are doing these works of the flesh, to just let them be. Whether it's for keeping of the peace, whether it's because we're afraid to look and announce sin to the face, but we have to have courage because when we see people like this, we warn them. We tell them what's wrong, whether it be homosexuality or abortion or you name it. Because we know that the end result of this, what will bring about this, is their death. And Jesus has not come that people would die. He comes that people will live. That's why he's come for you. And then he goes, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Right? Here's the opposite. Right? Love here is not just the emotion, I feel good about you. Love is service. It is commitment. It is the ship is going down and I'm going to go down with you. It's joy. Right? Kare. It's what Jesus has come. With great joy I announce unto you, unto you a Savior has been born. Peace. You know, peace is God's shalom. Peace is just not the absence of conflict. Peace is not the, the absence of war. Peace is that things in life are good. God, at the end of seven days, we we're told that there is he rests, and that rest, is part of that word comes from the word peace, right? He looks around, and everything is working as it should. God's word gives us peace, because it gives us what God has won for us. Patience, right? One of the fruits of the spirits is patience. This is where we get the word for long-suffering, right? Suffering, refusing to be irritated by the wrongs that people do to us. Right? A work of the Spirit is when people sin against us, we continue to work with them and push with them, even despite the anger and hostility that they may give to us. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Right? One of the fruits of the Spirit is faith. 
right? Sticking with something. The faithfulness here is where we get the word fidelity, right? To the bitter end, no matter what happens, we're stuck together. That is the fruit of the Spirit. It goes a long way. It's the opposite of self-assertion. And then he goes into gentleness. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the meek. It's the same word. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who have no power in and of themselves. Blessed are those who are at the opposite end, who can't change their lives. Here, Paul says one of the fruits of the Spirit is that we are meek, right? Which is the opposite of self-assertion too, right? Asserting yourself, declaring, here's who I am, right? These are opposite Christian values. Those are not Christian values. Gentleness and meekness are. And finally, he lists self-control. You know, we live in an age this really hits hard on us at times, right? How often do I hit that buy, put in my cart, uh, cart on Amazon, I click buy, and then I'm like, how long is it going to take to get here, even though it might be next day because I have Prime, right? Self-control means not getting what you want. In fact, telling your body, I will refrain from self-indulging myself. I will refrain from filling myself. I will instead go without self-control, a fruit of the Spirit. And then Paul writes, against these things, there is no law, right? You'd, there's no law saying, hey, it's a really bad thing for peace, right? You don't see a law out there outlawing peace. You don't see a law outlawing being gentle or kind or good or patience or any of those things, right? Because this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is what all laws are gaining at to try to get us to do by force. But the law never works that way. When you're told to do something it doesn't conjure up you the love and the ability to do it. It's always just done by force, right? When I tell you that you have to love me, I'm right, love your neighbor as yourself, but by telling you, you must love me, it doesn't give you any motivation for doing it, right? But the Lord Jesus Christ has come and by his spirit moves us to love. By his spirit cultivates in us. And that's what Paul would have us do here too. What he sees the work of the Spirit is that God is active in these things, right? He is doing this to us. It's not something we choose for ourselves, but we also come alongside and we cultivate these things as well, right? We come alongside and work with God in beating back our flesh. Times we're good, times we're not. But the point is get back on and keep doing it because the day is coming when Jesus Christ will bring about the completion of these things. Earlier, I had skipped it. I had missed it here. But Paul writes that at the end of all these things, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh if you keep with the Spirit. That word gratify is the same word that Jesus cried out on the cross when he said it's finished. Right? Because the fruit of the flesh, it brings forth death, eternal death. But the fruit of the Spirit brings forth everlasting life. So keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with these things, my dear brothers and sisters, though it may be hard. Come, have brothers and sisters in Christ that you can come to. Confess weaknesses and sins. To hear encouragement. To walk alongside that you may know that the Spirit is at work in you, and indeed He is. And then finally we hear, verse 24, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There's the kicker, right? Those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh. Now, how easy is it to crucify yourself, right? You might be able to do it at first, right? You put your first arm up and you take the nail and maybe hold it in and you smack it in. But then you soon find out that you can't get the rest of yourself on. Someone else must crucify you. That's Jesus. That's why he went to the cross. He went to be crucified so that when you go into the font, you die with him. That when you come to this table tonight, you continue to die with him too, right? We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, you want to continue to cultivate the work of the Spirit. If you want him to continue to put the fertilizer around the tree so the fruit grows, you come to the table this night. You confess your sins. And you receive from God all that he has won for you. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that which he has won for you is freedom that you may live in freedom, that you may cultivate freedom. And guess what? The day is coming when your flesh will be finally put to death and you won't struggle with it anymore, no matter what the sin is. That day is coming when Jesus will come and that good work which he has begun in you in the Spirit, he will bring to completion on the day when Jesus Christ returns.
And so, as Paul concludes, as we live by the Spirit and dear brothers and sisters in Christ, indeed you do, let us also keep in step. Let us march with him. May God grant that to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, having heard from the word of God this night and through the work of his Spirit in our midst, let us now turn and confess our faith in who God is and what he has done for us by speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go before our Lord this evening and asking him as he continues to help us crucify our flesh that he would grant us his spirit and we pray for the needs of those around us in our world and from our dear brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Please join with me in prayer. To God, dear Father in heaven, we ask that you would look upon us, your children here on earth, that you grant us mercy, you grant us grace, so that your name would be kept holy by us, and through all the world, through the pure and true teaching of your word, and the fervent love that we show forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all that is false, whether it be false teaching and false living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, so that they would be granted freedom as well, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, strengthen us by your Spirit, according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily, and sacrifice to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands, Father, we commend all whom we pray this night, and lifting them before you, for Mary, and Martha, for Sandy and Leah, for Rayanne and Linda, for Jan and Sandy, for Julie and Dawn, for Ardell and Tammy, for Joanna and Jerome, and for Carrie. And Lord, we continue to lift up before you Tim, and Lawrence, for Mary and Sienna, for Sharon and Fred, for Bill. Lord, we give thanks for the continued healing of Jan and ask that you would continue to comfort all those who mourn the loss of loved ones as well. Lord, we ask you to be with our government and those whom you have put into positions of authority that they would govern well and that we would be able to live in peace and in righteousness. Lord, in your mercy. Be with all those women who are pregnant and those with child, that they would be kept safe and be brought to term and be provided for and cared for all their days. Lord, we also lift up before you in our midst Hope and Savannah, for Ashley and Carly and Sydney. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but by your Spirit cultivate in us to turn from our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, dear Father in heaven, deliver us from all evil, both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust in you, O Lord, in your great mercy, that you will hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Congregation, at this time, please be seated. We will present the gifts that we collected before service, and we will present them to our Lord as we sing also the offertory. 
Receive this blessing from your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. At this point, I will have the congregation please be seated for a moment here. So, earlier this week, I received yet another call from a different congregation um, in Minnesota at St. Paul's Lutheran Church and School in Fairmont, Minnesota. Uh, I was kind of shocked. I didn't see it coming. Uh, so, back at it again of uh, deliberating and thinking it through and all of that. So I ask for your prayers yet again um, on all of this. This is one of those things where I have no control over largely. I can tell my DP I'm not interested, which I've already done in the past and things like that. But these churches get your name and they decide on things and they reach out to you. So, uh, so prayers with all of us as we go through the, the process again. If you have any questions about how all of it works, you know, my, my concern as I was going through and I was telling our elders tonight because I told them before the service. Uh, my always concern is that I'm not looking for these. So just so you know, they happen to kind of find me. Um, these churches that get together and they don't have a pastor, what they do is they have a list of people, no names, and they vote in their meetings, and then they extend the call. And I just happen to be the one they extended the call to in this past one. Uh, so keep me in your prayers. Keep their congregation in prayers as well. Um, and if you have any thoughts and questions, please let me know. We just got done doing this a month ago. Um, so hopefully it shouldn't be anything new. But if you do have any thoughts, let me know, please. Um, on um, all of this is one of the joys of being a pastor is you get calls like this from time to time and it scares you. Um, so we will continue this day, though, knowing that our Lord provides for us, for his people, as he just did this night. And we will conclude with our final hymn. Our hymn is hymn number 728, hymn 728, How Firm a Foundation. That's who our Lord is for you and for me. So we sing together, How Firm a Foundation. Your poor refuge has 
Oh.